So, we should begin, I think, yeah, time to start. I'm really excited to present to you today uh, on behalf of my co-PIs, Alex and Ike, also co-coordinators here. And so, uh, if you would, please draw your attention to the screen. I've been waiting one year to do that. <laughs> so, what's it all about? Well, in fact, it's about aging societies, in case that's a surprise to some of you. Um, the percentage of the population over age 64 is on the rise. This is Western Europe, but it's similar in a lot of uh, rich democratic societies. And it's predicted to continue rising. The green line is uh, GDP growth year over year. It's going down and it's uh, perhaps stagnant as things continue the way they are. And this means that the welfare state, the social security systems are not sustainable. The dependency ratio in the golden age of like four to one for you know, prime age workers for every pensioner is dropping below three in most places, approaching two, it's predicted to go below two, and this means that something has to be done if uh, the state as we know it today is to be sustainable, at least with people having their quality of life, right? We've heard something about it. And that means immigration is absolutely necessary, barring some other magical thing that comes along and solves the problem for us. And I don't imagine robots taking care of my grandparents. I don't think that they would be into that. Wir haben so vieles geschafft, wir schaffen das. We're going to build the wall, we have no choice. Build that wall, build that wall, build that wall. But immigration wall. comes build with some wall. other build factors, let's say. Build that wall. And one of the big build things that wall. Build is that group wall. conflict what you might categorize as group conflict. The boundaries are made salient in, under increasing immigration, or so say a lot of uh, social movements, so say a lot of scholars. And so ironically, immigration, which is so necessary, may actually undermine that which it's necessary to preserve. Have control of the mouse. Up oh, there. Okay. Pause in the action. Right. So uh, the idea, this necessary immigration, some theories say, like, yes, but as immigrants come, or even the threat of immigrants, because you see places like Japan or Eastern Europe, uh, where there aren't so many immigrants, but there is a strong reaction. Uh, brings people to either just be anti-immigrant and support anti-immigrant policies or an even more interesting um, hypothesis which is that group boundaries are made salient and uh, people are protective of their resources. They don't want to share resources. There's experimental research which suggests that um, people would even share less with their own group if 
if they think that those resources would also be shared with outgroups such as immigrants. So the people that need the social services themselves would be perhaps more opposed to them, knowing, oh, that these like free riding or outgroup immigrants are taking them as well. And so this also could retrench the welfare state, the thing that the immigrants would be necessary to support. Interesting conundrum. So don't have to with this. <laughs> it's frozen. So this is the launching point of the crowdsource replication initiative. And uh, the problem in this area of research is that it relies really heavily on macro comparative survey data. Uh, because it's about comparing all these different countries which are having reactions to immigration, including Germany today. And um, there's only so many data sources to compare these countries. Maybe half of the studies published are using international social survey program data, for example. And so in, you know, in honor of this uh, crisis of replicability, we don't have the chance to assess the reliability of these studies. We, and just pick up the exact same data and, and look at it again. And so that's what we're doing here in this crowdsourced replication initiative. And it follows uh, something that probably most of you are familiar with, this Silbertson et al, blah, 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 NOSEC uh, study, which did this method and gave this football data to analysts. So we're, we're following very much a similar trajectory as this study. But we have some key differences, and one of them is this secondary data that people are already, many already familiar with, which is kind of, because in this study, the data was brand new, no one had ever seen it before, and many of the researchers are like working in the field already. So it was already an interesting question to see, is this even possible to do this under these conditions? It's a lot of work, uh, beautiful in, Theory, messy in practice, that would be like a cards against humanity uh, question. If any other. Um, anyway, so sometime around January 2018, in the planning process for this conference, um, we, we started to come up with this idea. And um, basically, we conducted some power analyses, and we, we figured out that if we could get 40 teams, we could do it. If we could get 40 teams, we could do it. If we could get 60 teams, we could run an experiment while doing it. So when we closed the, the call in July, um, we had 106 teams and we had 215 researchers. Teams were called for one to three persons per team. Now after the survey, we were running a survey of the, of the uh, people in the CRI, we're calling it, um, there was dropout and we were left with about 87, 88 teams, 187 researchers. And almost all of them completed the replication, which we gave them. And then there was another phase of dropout in the expansion and there's still some promised they're going to turn in the expansion. I promise, don't kick me out. Uh, so they're in there. Um, and in the end, we settled on a study about this topic. This is a topic that I, I also am uh, publishing and working in the area. Um, Does Immigration Undermine Public Support for Social Policy? By Dave Brady and Ryan Finnegan. And the, the beauty of it was that we communicated with the researchers beforehand and they were like, cool, yeah, we're, we're on board with this, we're, we're open to it. So it felt really like a nice process from the get-go in that, in that regard. And also the study we chose because it's, it's quite transparent. So they have their supplemental materials online. They have code available online, and it's in, a, it's in quite a prominent location, so American Sociological Review, um, so it has a lot of visibility. And it uses this ISSP data that so many of the studies use. But because we got so many teams, we were able to do an experiment. And that was, we gave randomly half the original study with all of its materials, which are freely available. And the other half we gave what we'll call the opaque version. And that was that we, we rewrote the study enough that it was no longer possible to determine that it was this original study. And we didn't give the numeric results to the participants. Because there's the idea, a form of bias would be, well, I just keep replicating till I hit those numbers. 
that I see in the paper. So here we just gave them the uh, sense of the direction and the significance of the results, but asked them to produce their own results. This also tested the idea that the transparency of a study uh, makes it more replicable, like in terms of just verifying the verifiability of the study, which suggests it's already an argument in favor of sharing and being transparent. Because if people are going to screw up the replication of my work, this could be really bad for, for me, right? So this is a nice argument. And so what happened was we have, uh, this is the original version. And here's the opaque version. And these are uh, replicating odds ratios. We just followed Brady and Finnegan, focused on effects in, in the form of odds ratios. So whatever arguments about that aside, that was the task, to replicate those odds ratios. And these are exact replications on the zero. And this is, this is the mean. And you'll notice, of course, the mean absolute difference is higher in this less transparent opaque group. But also the confidence is wider. So you have this wider variability under less transparency. In the second phase, we, we wanted to build on this um, Silvertson study. They, they had a kind of deliberation on the research designs, but it was through email. So it was just, uh, you know, it was kind of a little bit of feedback here and there. And we wanted to say, let's take on these research design components head on. So let's put these uh, participants in a setting where they can really deliberate with one another and see if this improves science in general, but if it improves the crowdsourcing process. And so we randomly gave half the researchers a deliberation. Uh, it is an online platform called Kialo. And they were put into this context. They submitted their research designs. So they, they had to, ahead of time, plan an expansion for this study. We collected the research designs and coded them and extracted the main kind of points of difference or contention or just the main points, and we put them into this deliberation. And the beauty of Kialo is that you don't have to, uh, participants don't have to say anything because maybe their arguments are already there and they can just vote and say, yes, I agree with this or no, I disagree with this. So it's a very easy way to participate. Or they can also add if they have arguments. And this is just an example about um, modeling and estimation that I pulled from the actual deliberation. And then the other random half did just worked on their research designs. They didn't do this deliberation. Um, there was participation. There was, there was a fair amount of non-participants, too. But in terms of voting, checking whether I support or don't support these different um, theses, as they're called, different arguments in the deliberation, 15% voted on all of them. This is self-reported. Um, but 47% voted on some. So overall, a majority did actually participate. And then there are some who did not vote, and then there's missing. Um, we didn't force them to respond to the survey for the most part. Um, so here, we, we had four um, dependent variables that we, we pre-registered we pre our analysis plans. So whatever you call that, a PAP, I believe. Uh, for a sociologist, this is like something really new and different. And um, one out of the four was, was uh, significantly different between the groups. And this was self-reported learning, self-reported learning between the, um, those who participated and those who didn't. So then we have the expansion phase, right? So they have completed their research designs. Some of them deliberated. And then we're like, OK, do the expansion following your research design, right? We had this research designs first to try to remove this bias that, well, they just start playing around with the data until they find an expansion they like. And instead, no, you, what do you think the data generating model is? What do you think is a better test? You saw Brady and Finnegan's approach. What's, what's your idea? Is there a, you know, what's the data generating model? What's a robustness test? Is there a better way to test this hypothesis? And another way we tried to root out bias, just so you know, and some of you in this room were participants, is we said everyone's a co-author. We're not, it's not about what you find. We don't need to see significant stars, right? We, everyone's a co-author. So we were just really interested in doing the tasks. So we were trying to eliminate bias in that regard as well. So for the expansion phase, we haven't coded the numerical results yet. They're, they're all over the place because we, we asked for 1% uh, change in the stock of foreign-born. What are the average marginal effects from that? And a 
point one out of a thousand net migration change. What are the average marginal effects? Well, a lot of these models that people just wanted to run, don't, you, you can't really calculate these the same way we think about them. So they're, they're all over the place, very interesting. You have Bayesian models, you have all kinds of two-level, three-level models. But we do have, these uh, are the conclusions of the researchers based on their findings in the expansion phase. And 58% would reject the hypothesis that immigration undermines support for social policy. So 58% supported Brady and Finnegan's original conclusions. In these wild set of different models, we also said you could use, you have to use the ISSP data, right? We needed some, this is kind of replication, but they could use different waves. So they were able to use the newest wave or older waves, and they were able to use different countries. So Brady and Finnegan used basically the richest 13 or 17 countries, um, and there is a, you know, a whole world of countries that could be used. 17% were mixed support. Mixed support meant that uh, the two different test variables for immigration, stock and net migration, so change, uh, went in different directions, or one was no finding and one was a finding. But mixed, it had to be finding towards support in one of them. And 16% said, yeah, we looked at the data and it supports it. Immigration undermines social policy preferences. There's this negative effect. There's this negative effect. Now, 9% said it's actually not testable. We looked at the data. Um, these, de these dependent variables, these attitude variables, they're non-invariant. Or there's something else about the data that means this hypothesis just isn't testable. Maybe something along the lines of methodological nationalism, right? Where it's like we're treating these countries like cases of something and then measuring qualities of them and that this is somehow fallacious. Like it, it just shouldn't be done. It doesn't actually test anything. What is a country? What is, yeah. What, what do these data measure? So just out of curiosity and to give you an idea where we're going. Um, on the left, we have strong support. That means support, they concluded support, or they found net migration to have a support. Because in our, in our thinking, net migration is the more important of the two variables. Because the argument should really be if immigration increases, that's when we should see, you know, if the number of immigrants or the rate of immigration increases, that's when we should really see it. And so if they found mixed support, but support of that particular one, we coded that as strong support. And we can see that about 23% here would, would be in this strong support category. But, and this is where we're going with it, it, de it depends. It depends on a lot of things. So we have like a huge data set with over 100 variables of model characteristics, estimators, different countries, etc. And so this is where we will do this really new thing, for me anyways, this specification analysis, where how can we explain the variance of these outcomes based on the qualities of the model? Oh my god, it's time's up. Um, but I'm almost done. But interestingly, this is, how, this is what we want to really say something about. Notice that dichotomous has the lowest uh, support. So they're the most likely to reject, meaning they're the most likely to support Brady and Finnegan's original hypothesis. Brady and Finnegan's original findings were all based on dichotomous treatment of the dependent variable. Now these are, some of you are familiar with the ISSP, these are attitude questions which are like strongly agree, you know, disagree, agree, et cetera. And so if they're treated differently, the, there's a big difference. And this, we think, points us especially towards theory, towards talking about the data generating model. And that's what we're most interested in. And that's what I think is the most important thing, right? How, how can we explain things? If it, is it right to treat it as a di dichotomy or not? Is that really the data generating model? We need to talk about that because it seems to matter a lot if we do that. Over here, we have partial support that's mixed. Any mixed support and support outright put together. And notice in the if we look at categorical and treat that, we actually have a majority now in support. So although we find this is really preliminary, we find evidence generally supporting Brady and Finnegan. But we also find a lot of other things going on. And we want to sort of work on it and sort that out. And 
things like this will, will do that for us. I'm not going to go into detail, but this is like, again, running a regression to explain. This is back, we have coded the replication odds ratios, and this explains some of that. Interestingly, we ask them if they believe the hypothesis is true. Doesn't matter if they do or don't for the outcome. But if they're really certain about that, this seems to have a big effect. I could give you an expl explanation for that, but I'm, I'm out of time. I really encourage you to check out our executive report. We've made one part of this study public. You can look at all the questionnaires and the communications. And our, our executive report, which has a lot of descriptives and whatnot, um, and all the authors are attached to this. And so it was supposed to be released as a preprint, but at about 3 AM last night, I thought, oh, this is going to take another like two hours to add everybody as an author, so maybe tonight. Anyways, there's the OSF. Thanks for your attention. And I'm directing my own questions for yeah, 10, 10 so. minutes. We uh, don't have I'll so much time. Uh, OK. OK. Any questions? <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, so uh, going back to the, the, the keynote this morning, I was curious, now you know you have this amazing data set that you gather and you have this, um, uh, uh, you know, a uh, lot of potential hypotheses to test. Um, how are you going to go about that process? Uh, did you uh, register your hypothesis in advance about the outcome of this um, um, study or how, how, how did you deal with that? So we registered two analysis plans related to our two experiments, but we didn't register anything about what we expected from the crowdsourcing because we honestly weren't sure. It was a, it was a sort of honest replication effort to see what, what would come out of this. But in terms of the analytical approach, I'm, it's new to me, but this uh, specification analysis is a way of uh, looking at all the numerical results as a dependent variable and the features of the model and sample and stuff like that as the independent variables and trying to explain, um, explain the differences based on those variables. And big, big points in there could really point towards interesting theoretical things like, OK, this matters a lot, so we need to really focus our theoretical efforts on this particular feature of the model or this variable. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it was mentioned also tomorrow in the, uh, no, this morning in the keynote, uh, an alternative model would be to gather many knowledgeable researchers and let them discuss about what is the best way to do these analysis and then decide on one, the best of all models, and uh, th that's it. Uh, uh, do you have any indication in your data whether uh, this really works? Uh, perhaps the deliberation group might be some condition that uh, I didn't understand it correctly whether, whether it will go to this direction. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so we would be curious if there's a long-term effect in the deliberation group, but one of the phases that I was unable to share with you because, it, well, a lot of people are still should respond to the survey. We, we did a post-results uh, deliberation and then a survey of the research designs. So we coded all the research designs into a standardized format that was pretty easy to read, like how's the dependent variable treated, what's the estimator, is it multi-level, is there, et cetera. And then we had the researchers vote on these. How likely is this? This was a Silbertson et al. method. How likely is this to, to test this? You know, how much do you rely on, would you rely on the results of this model? And so we're actually going to have a, a subjective ranking among all researchers of the research designs. So we can present results as all research designs equal, and then we can present results as some are uh, ranked higher among these uh, researchers and experts as being a better test. And so we could see maybe of those models that are ranked higher as a better test, most of them support the hypothesis. We haven't uh, collected and coded all that data yet. 
is so a great idea, and hopefully we're, we're going that direction. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, obviously fantastic project, congratulations. Um, I'm wondering um, about your contact or the contact of the teams with the original authors, uh, because I wonder how they felt about all this. Uh, so and my exact question is, or questions are, how did you approach them in the first place? Like, what, how, how did you convey to them that it's, it's a good thing for them to be replicated? And then the other question is, how were they involved? How were they involved in the process of all this? For example, did they get some preliminary results, or were they able to comment on this report, the final report? Sorry. Um, so we. I put the email conversation I had, I mean, I know Dave Brady, I knew Dave Brady from before, and Ryan, I met him at a few times, and I put the email conversation on our OSF page. There's probably like a smiley in there somewhere. It's, maybe it's a little embarrassing, but it's transparent. Um, but it's, yeah, it, it was quite like, you know, we're, we're going to do this crowdsource thing. We're thinking about replicating your study, because at that time, we hadn't decided on their study. We had some other studies in mind. We had some original data that hadn't been seen before, and we weren't sure. And so we were kind of, eh, how do they react to this? Uh, and, but they were quite, I mean, a little skeptical. You can tell a little skeptical, but they were, you know, I assured them this is no kind of witch hunt. Like, we're really just, this is a construction of knowledge. This is about, you know, doing things differently and better. And they seemed fine with that. And then Dave Brady and a teammate, uh, registered to take part in the replication. But that was around the time his AJS article came out and he r really took off. He was already like quite a well-known Scott and then he like really took off and the teammate dropped out and so he was like, I'm really sorry. I really wanted to participate and try some Bayesian modeling. I've been thinking about it, but then he had to drop out, unfortunately. The last part of your question though, I hadn't really thought about. We, we have kept them in this communication with the emails with participants all along. But I think, yeah, it would be an interesting idea to keep them connected to the final product somehow and, and get their feedback. It sounds like a good idea. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. This is a really interesting project, and, uh, and congratulations on doing this. It must have also been a lot of work. Um, I have two questions. Um, the, the first is, um, what's the trade-off of using a data set uh, that people might have experience with or not versus a data set that nobody has seen? Um, just that's an open question. What are the, why did you in the end chose to use data that, that some people know or not? And the second is maybe related to that is in the, the people that participate in the efforts um, do you have any information of whether or not they are, for instance, very well-trained multi-level modelers or uh, engaged in the debates? Do you have any of that sort? Because at least some of the names I recognize were like, hey, that person is kind of involved and that person is really, it's really something different for that person. So uh, just, you know, if you can elaborate a little bit on that. Sure, sure. It's just here you'll have to cut me off when we're at time. For example, the multi-level, uh, whoops. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, surprise. <laughs> uh, the, the, the MLM skill is a scale of their methods and especially multi-level modeling skills and, and whatnot. And though it is uh, a one-tailed significance, but um, they're more likely to get the exact replication if they have those skills. So in a very important control variable, about half were in sociology, um, about like, 15% were methods type or, or economics, which for a sociologist is like a methods degree. And um, there was political science and communications uh, also, and then some psychologists, um, someone who was a data analyst for the New York Times. We're still kind of like waiting for him to say, hey, can we, can we well, we'll see. Uh, anyways. <laughs> um, so it was, it was quite a mix. As, regarding the data, um, I mean, that was the question. Uh, there, we had to advertise something about the data. We, we felt in our discussions, we had to say a little bit about the topic. So there was this selection effect that the researchers would be interested in it. So we have some who are like, crowdsourcing, awesome, I'm going to do it. And then others who are like, immigration and social policy, I want to be a part of this project. And so from like this, this is like a, contamin a contamination of 
what we're trying to do, possibly. But that's why we wanted to do it, to see if could we learn from this process anyways, despite this. And for me, like, I'm working in this area a lot, and it always feels like running in circles, like we're at a dead end. And I thought, is this a way we can like, produce better research? Right? Because we have this, um, these like, running billions of regressions approach, like this Young and Munoz approach, if you've seen this paper. And in our case, it's a little bit like that, but the regressions are sort of real, because they came from researchers who we said, sit down and think about what is a plausible model, not just try everything. So yeah, it's, it's a learning process for sure. Thanks. Uh, very fascinating project. So too much for me to pick up everything now at this point uh, of the workshop. Um, but you're saying, at least in the paper which I looked up, now you're saying uh, you want to test or illustrate or develop crowdsourcing as a social science method. So, I mean, that's a general question for me, like the multi-lab project by Brian Nosek and so on, it's always great, but the question is, does it scale? And I usually think it doesn't scale, right? So how could you put this on a permanent basis? And I mean, next time these people probably wouldn't do it again. I know from one participator it was a lot of time, <laughs> yeah. and he was fine with getting on the author list, but the second time, third time, probably not. So how could you scale this then? Yeah, I'm, I'm unsure, to be honest, but some of it depends on something which is, has a lot to do with why we're all here today, and that is like, what if this uh, main paper that we pl plan to publish, because we have at least three, two related to the experiments, and then the main hypothesis test, what if it goes in a super high-ranked journal? Then it's different, right? Suddenly all the participants are like, oh, let's do that again, right? Maybe, I don't know. So I, I don't know, though. The answer is really, honestly, I don't know how to scale it. If you have ideas, that would be, yeah. yeah fair enough. Yes, yeah, so Vernon Gale once again. Uh, so obviously I was one of the participants in yeah. one of the teams. Okay. Um, and for in this sort of question, I just wonder, maybe not in this sort of circumstance, but I can see many circumstances where something like a one-day hackathon or a two-day hackathon could work really well for this sort of thing, especially with grad students, or maybe even a week-long retreat somewhere where you kind of sit down and bust it out, and at the end you've got something concrete. So yeah, I do think there's a possible scalability in that sort of way. That was the last question, yeah. Yeah, we, we gotta move on to other things. So thank you so much for your attention, yeah.